So good afternoon. I'm Evan Weiner, and thank you, Michelle, for inviting me to the Tenafly Senior Center for this talk on 1963. And um, this talk came about because of three reasons. One, I was walking my granddaughter through Bronxville, roughly at the time John F. Kennedy would have celebrated his 103rd birthday, and there's this monument in, in Bronxville to him because Unlike the, the story that's told, he grew up in Boston, he and the family actually grew up in Bronxville. Bobby Kennedy spent most of his, in fact, all of his youth until 1940 in Bronxville. Uh, the other was uh, a picture came up on Facebook of my friend Jane Tillman Irving, who works at WCBS Radio, who worked at WCBS Radio. And uh, about seven years ago, uh, she did a uh, multi-part series on uh, attending the March on Washington and uh, also listening to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream talk. And then the other was the funeral of John Lewis. All three of them came together literally at once. And I said, you know, that's an omen. I should do a 1963 talk. Um, the end of Camelot was November 22nd, 1963, at least according to Jacqueline Kennedy. According to everybody else, there was no such thing as Camelot. We'll talk about that when we get to the end of this talk. But there was a whole bunch of things that happened in 1963. Uh, there were a whole bunch of things that happened in 1963, aside from the Kennedy assassination. As I mentioned, Jane Tillman Irving uh, attended the I Have a Dream um, speech. Uh, that was on August 28th, 1963. Vietnam, the U.S. troops were there in 1963, and there were casualties in 1963, even though the U.S. was not in the war with North Vietnam at that point. Sit-ins in no service. The civil rights movement continued uh, in the South, um, which started around 1955 with Rosa Parks not, going, uh, not giving up her seat on the bus in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, but the real civil rights movement uh, started in 1941 uh, with a guy by the name of A. Philip Randolph, and he is prominent in 1963, as you will find out in a few minutes. Demonstrations and arrests, there is Martin Luther King being arrested uh, after um, a demonstration uh, in the South in Birmingham. The space race in the Cold War, that's the final Mercury mission of, uh, of Cooper flying into space. He spent a, a day in space, which seems, and back in 1963, seemed to be an eternity. Today, it's just a blink of the eye. Uh, the United States and the Soviet Union were both in a race to uh, get to the moon. Uh, the Soviets had a woman astronaut by the name of Valentina Trushkikova. She uh, was the first woman into space, launched in 1963. Uh, Kennedy ended up in Berlin, taking a look at uh, the Berlin Wall and giving a talk in Berlin. Uh, George Wallace told Negro students, you are not welcomed here at the University of Alabama in 1963. Beatle mania started in 1963, and uh, coincidentally enough, it could have kicked off on November 22nd, 1963 in the United States with Walter Cronkite on the Walter Cronkite newscast of that night. But something else happened on November 22nd, 1963. So take a look at this picture. There's Ted Kennedy, there's Jacqueline Kennedy, there's Carolyn Kennedy, John Kennedy Jr. Uh, along with uh, Robert F. Kennedy and members of the Kennedy family behind them in this picture. And to certain people, and I am of this generation because I was born in 1956, we learned that it was the end of the 1950s innocence, the end of Leave it to Beaver and all that other wonderful stuff. Uh, it probably wasn't the end of the innocence, but it's perceived perception. John Kennedy was killed and America lost its innocence. But was there an innocence to begin with? 1963, there I am with my mask. Told you I walked in front of that monument. In fact, uh, the bottom of that monument, which you can't see, uh, ends by saying, Bronxville newspaper, local man wins presidency. That's it. There's nothing after 1960 on that monument. But in 1963, the United States was a divided country in a changing world. 
And here is what was going on. The Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962, is in the rearview mirror, but the Cold War tensions between the U.S. and the USSR continue. The two countries install a hotline. There are 15,000 American advisors who are stationed in South Vietnam, and of course, the Civil Rights Movement, uh, which really kicked off in 1941, but Rosa Parks seems to be the line where people start at. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement con it continues with demonstrations throughout American Southern states. Uh, there is uh, Dwight Eisenhower, the 34th President of the United States, and John Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States, uh, back um, during the transition between the Eisenhower administration and the Kennedy administration. And the guy that they backed in South Vietnam was a guy by the name of Diem. And uh, he was Eisenhower's guy, he was JFK's guy, and he was the one who was going to be the protector of South Vietnam from communism and by proxy the Soviet Union or communist China. Diem was the U.S. guy. He was assisted by U.S. military and economic aid, was able to resettle hundreds of thousands of refugees who fled the North after France got out of in the French Indochina and there was a civil war between North Vietnam and South Vietnam. But he was uh, Catholic and his own Catholicism and the preference he showed for fellow Roman Catholics made him very unacceptable to the overwhelming majority of people in South Vietnam who were Buddhists. So not only do you have a civil war, but you have a lot of resistance within South Vietnam Roman Catholics against Buddhists, and this is what the Americans are involved in. Now, why are they there? Well, there's this thing called the domino theory. Take a look at the hand in this cartoon. The hand is pushing Laos, pushing Vietnam, pushing Taiwan, pushing Korea, pushing the Philippines, pushing Japan, Canada, and ultimately the United States. That the USSR is, uh, in, is trying to get world dominance and if they could somehow knock off Vietnam, the other dominoes would fall as well, including in the area, Cambodia and Laos in Thailand and eventually Taiwan. Uh, the domino theory had been around since the 1950s. Uh, John Kennedy advocated for the U.S. involvement in Vietnam when he was the senator from Massachusetts in 1956. Now, my father told me he was born in 1932, so he would be about 22 years old at the time, that he thought he was going to South Vietnam or Vietnam as he was in the Army at that point. He was in the Army from 1953 through 1955, and um, he thought he was headed there. But Dwight Eisenhower said, you know what? We just finished up in Korea. Let's not just jump into Vietnam. Now, the French pull out of Vietnam, or French Indochina at that point. Uh, in Eisenhower's 1954 view, though, the loss of Vietnam to communist control would lead to similar communist victories in the neighboring countries in the southeast, which include Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand, and elsewhere, India, Japan, Philippines, Indonesia, and even Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the Battle of Apac, three are dead. Uh, that was uh, in early January of 1963. Uh, these were advisors who were in Vietnam. It was January 2nd, 1963. The Viet Cong claimed the victory after it shot down five American helicopters. An American officer was killed. Three other service men were injured in the action. The Battle of Apac was the first major combat victory by the Viet Cong against the South Vietnamese Army of the Republic of Vietnam and U.S. forces. It wasn't quite a war. It was a military action that the Americans were involved in at that time, but it would lay the groundwork for eventually the Vietnam War. Uh, there's a napalm blast by way, South Korea, or rather South Vietnam, February 28th of 1963. Meanwhile, as things are developing in Vietnam, the segregationist wins the gubernatorial spot in Alabama, that is George C. Wallace. And his inauguration dress, address is January 14th, 1963. He becomes the governor of Alabama officially. And his inaugural, spe in his inaugural speech, he says, 
segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. This is 98 years after the end of the Civil War. Uh, meanwhile, there's another front that JFK has to watch. That's the Soviets. Now, uh, he successfully, or at least he and Khrushchev worked out a deal where uh, the Soviets would not put missiles in Cuba in 1962, but Kennedy pulled missiles out of Turkey as part of the deal. And on top of that, Kennedy pledged not to invade Cuba forever uh, after the Bay of Pigs disaster in 1961. But that didn't stop the American government from attempting to assassinate or kill Fidel Castro, which they never did. Anyway, Khrushchev is in East Germany. East Germany, part of the Warsaw Bloc countries uh, or the Iron Curtain countries. Uh, Nikita Khrushchev makes a visit to the Berlin Wall from East Berlin side and then delivers an address to the communist leadership of East Germany at the SED Party Congress. Khrushchev claimed that the USSR had a 100 megaton nuclear bomb. Whether they did or not, the claim was never substantiated, but it sounded good uh, from Nikita Khrushchev. But there's a problem in Khrushchev's world. Not only is he dealing with the West, the enemies in the West, the, the United States, England, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, but he's got a problem with Mao Zedong in China. Uh, as Stewie Gates, who was my social studies teacher in ninth grade uh, at Spring Valley Junior High School, right over the border in Rockland County in New York, used to call them Communist China or Red China. Uh, Mao didn't like Khrushchev, and Khrushchev didn't like Mao. Uh, the relationships between uh, the Soviet Union and China reached the breaking point. Uh, the two of them exchanged literally schoolyard bully stuff um, in 1960, and that uh, continued uh, through 1963. In June, officials from the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China, Communist China, Red China, met in Moscow. The Chinese government had become openly critical. Well, they hadn't become openly critical. They had been openly critical since 1960 of what it referred to as the growing counter-revolutionary trends in the Soviet Union. In particular, China was unhappy, Communist China, Red China, Stewie Gates, if you're watching, uh, was unhappy with the Soviet Union's policy of cooperation with the West. Later that year, uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev worked out a deal, or their diplomats did, nuclear test ban plan, uh, the uh, first test of the ban agreement uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union ratified by the Senate on October 10th. The agreement banned the above ground testing of nuclear weapons. This guy ran for Senate in 1992 from North Carolina against Jesse Helms. His name is Harvey Gantt, and Harvey Gantt uh, in 1963 was about 22, 23 years old. Uh, a black student, Harvey Gantt, enters Clemson University in South Carolina. That would be the last state to hold out against racial desegregation. Actually, it wasn't Alabama. It was South Carolina. Now, some of you may have read The Feminine Mystique. Some of you may have heard about Betty Friedan. There was no such thing as the women's rights movement until 1963 but it really kicks off in 1966. The woman's rights movement does not exist, but Betty Friedan publishes a book, the book, The Feminine Mystique. In 1957, Friedan was asked to conduct a survey of her former Smith College classmates, who graduated in 1942, one of the Seven Sister Schools, for their 15th anniversary reunion. The results, well, wasn't exactly the Donna Reed show or any of those other TV shows during those days like uh, Leave it to Be Beaver or Dennis the Menace or whatever other shows that there were. The results were a little different than what people thought. She found that many of them were unhappy with their lives as housewives. Now, this was not supposed to be a book. This was supposed to be a magazine article, but Life and Look and all the other magazines, Time, uh, Newsweek, um, and the, the whole array of magazines that were available in 1963, showed no interest 
Playboy didn't show any interest either. Uh, so she decided, you know what? I'm going to write a book. She writes the book, The Feminine Mistake. The book uh, is read by people in Congress and uh, particularly people like Edith Green in Oregon, who is a congresswoman called the mother of education, among other things. Uh, and there's a push in Congress to at least give women equal pay for equal jobs with men. And there is The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan. And that is the Equal Pay Act. Uh, as John Kennedy signs that into law, and somewhere in that uh, picture is Edith Green, who uh, was the uh, member uh, of Congress who pushed for this of the fourth district in Oregon. So there's John Kennedy signing it. Of course, there still is a discrepancy in pay between men and women. So it was good in terms of PR, but um, really didn't do all that much because it wasn't enforced evenly. It's the Equal Pay Act of 1963. It's June 10th, 1963, signed into law by John Kennedy. Congress stated that sex discrimination depresses wages and living standards for employees, prevents the maximum utilization of, the of available labor sources. It was not enforced evenly. The women's movement would become the second civil rights movement in the United States in the 1960s. Betty Friedan in 1966 would form the National Organization of Women. Iraq, the name Saddam Hussein probably, I'll use a 1960s term, rings a bell with you. Well, in 1963, Saddam Hussein comes back to Iraq. The Ramadan Revolution, or the February 8th Revolution, was a coup d'etat in Iraq. It was a military coup by the Ba'ath Party. Uh, and its Iraqi wing, which overthrew the five-year-old regime of the pr uh, Prime Minister of Iraq, uh, Ab al-Karim Qasim, uh, Saddam Hussein would return to power or into a powerful position, not running the country, uh, after a four-year exile with the Ba'ath Party taking power. He had been in Egypt. He fled Iraq after he took plot, took part in the plot to kill al-Karim Kassim. Meanwhile, uh, some other names that you might recognize too, even in 2020, the Ba'ath Party in Syria comes back to Syria and takes over. The March Revolution, engineered by the military committee of the Syrian regional branch of the Arab Socialist Ba'ath Party. The coup was planned by the military committee rather than the Ba'ath Party civilian leadership, but uh, Michelle Aflac, the leader of the party consented to the conspiracy. The leading members of the military committee throughout the planning process and in the immediate aftermath of taking power were Mohammed Yurim, Salah Yadid, and uh, this name that may sound very familiar to you, Hafaz al-Assad. Al-Assad's son is still running Syria. 57 years later. So the Assad family has had a grip on power since 1963 in Syria through this particular Syrian civil war. Uh, a political problem with an eye on 1964. John Kennedy was a politician. He was a president and he was running for re-election in 1964 and didn't want to be the first president since Herbert Hoover not to win re-election. In fact, there have been very few presidents who ran for re-election who did not win. Grover Cleveland was one, uh, but he would come back for a second term after beating Benjamin Harrison, and Harrison was another one who did not win uh, when he was running for re-election, nor did Jimmy Carter. So, uh, John Kennedy didn't want to be one of those guys. And in the South, here you got people demonstrating, Messrs. Kennedy, Welsh, Loshi, enforce the fair job opportunities, fight and work for freedom. Uh, the NAACP, Freedom Now, NAACP, write your congressman to support civil rights, NAACP. Now, the perceived perception is John Kennedy did an awful lot, an awful lot for the civil rights movement. And it's one of those things that we have, have romanticized with Kennedy since he was assassinated. 
But a look at history suggests something totally different. Uh, JFK was very, very, very slow in supporting the civil rights movement in 1961, 1962. In fact, in 1961, yeah, Kennedy did step in. It was a very minor thing that he did, but he would support the Freedom Riders going through the South to a certain extent. Uh, John Kennedy and his brother Robert, the Attorney General, were able to end segregation on interstate buses, such as the Greyhound buses, uh, in November, or trailways, in November of 1961. It was a little victory, but it allowed people from the North, particularly Negroes, uh, to get onto a bus and go to demonstrations in the South. So that was one thing he did. And then there was James Meredith, who wanted to go to the University of Mississippi. Uh, politically, it was poison for JFK to act. Uh, looking through the political calculus, John F. Kennedy felt it just wasn't something that he needed to do if he wanted to be reelected re in 1964, because he felt if he did do something, he probably would give away the st southern states some of which helped him in 1960 when he had that razor thin victory because of Illinois winning in, Ch in Cook County, Chicago. Um, and uh, that victory in Illinois put him over the top. In the fall of 1962, James Meredith tried to enroll in the all white University of Mississippi. The federal government did back his right to do so. In fact, one other thing the Kennedys did or John Kennedy did through um, his uh, interior secretary, Udell, was forced the Washington football team to desegregate simply because, and this is 1962, uh, the racist owner of the football team, George Preston Marshall, who would tell anybody he was a racist, wanted to move to a new stadium. And uh, Udell said to uh, um, George Preston Marshall, if you want to play in that new stadium, you have to desegregate because it was built with federal money and it was an equal opportunity employment place. Uh, ultimately, George Preston Marshall gave in and uh, picked up Bobby Mitchell, who's a great football player. Could have been a dentist, but uh, he, it was great for him because he was every party that meant anything in Washington. Bobby Mitchell was there. So anyway, so there, was a, there were a couple things that he did, but not very much. The federal government backed Meredith's right to do so. The governor of Mississippi, Russ Barnett, vowed to block Meredith from attending classes. Meredith once again tried to register for class. He had federal marshals at his side. There was rioting on the campus. Two people were killed. Kennedy sent federal troops to the campus and James Meredith was able to get an education. But, uh, and also in 1962, November 62, Kennedy issued an executive order to end housing discrimination. But um, people like Martin Luther King would say to John F. Kennedy, where's the civil rights bill? And Kennedy would say, now is not the time. And Martin Luther King and others would say, well, if now is not the time, when, then when? Kennedy ignored the calls from Martin Luther King and the others that he introduced civil rights legislation. Uh, intimidation going through the South, that's the Henry Ford Museum. Uh, I was there three years ago and uh, it's Henry Ford, believe it or not, that they have this type of thing in his museum because you know the history of Henry Ford. Um, anyway, intimidation, um, the Ku Klux Klan. Segregation, also the Henry Ford Museum, uh, the white waiting room, the colored waiting room for your train or your bus by wife in the mill. Uh, different water fountains. Whites only can drink out of that water fountain. Blacks, they had their own water fountain, colored or Negro water fountains. Martin Luther King would go to jail for demonstrations. Uh, this one in Birmingham, Alabama, he is prisoner, 7089. Uh, and he would write a letter from the Birmingham jail. April 12th, 1963, the doctor, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on Good Friday violated a court injunction prohibiting public civil rights demonstrations in the city of Birmingham. Local police arrested King, a handful of protesters, including the Reverend Ralph Abernathy. Uh, 
and transported them to the Birmingham City Jail, where 40 years earlier, a prisoner had penned a mournful folk ballad about the place that included the line, write me a letter, send it by mail, send it in care of the Birmingham Jail. Now, the King Letters, or the King Letter, is considered one of the most important documents uh, of King's career. Early in uh, his eight-day imprisonment, King began composing a response to white ministers who asked, why? Why are you, why are the protesters in Birmingham? And those pieces of paper given to his lawyers became known as the letter from Birmingham jail, uh, maybe the most important written document of the civil rights era, basically to sum it up in four words, he was fighting injustice. Now, images like this from Birmingham started to come in. I do not have my cell phone in front of me, but there is a uh, correlation or uh, a comparison between 1963 and 2020. Uh, in 1963, it was television cameras uh, and the Cronkite show and the Huntley Brinkley show and the Howard K. Smith show that brought images like this into your living room. Um, in 2020, it was the image of a police officer on the neck of George Floyd when the explosion across the country in terms of getting people out in the streets and demonstrating happened. Uh, different platforms, same type of, uh, it's a different platform, television as opposed to phones, but it's the same delivery. It's a video and a video speaks loud and it spoke to John Kennedy. Birmingham officials reacted to uh, King demonstration. Uh, their reactions uh, changed perceptions. Television caught the police beatings of nonviolent marchers. Firemen turning their high pressure hoses on defenseless men, women, and children. Police dogs shredding the clothing of demonstrators, all on video. This actually was film, it wasn't video, but it was on Huntley Brinkley, and it was on Cronkite, and it was on Howard K. Smith, NBC, CBS, and ABC. And this picture was on the cover of the New York Times on May 4th, 1963, an attack dog going after a demonstrator, and that too caught John Kennedy's eye. That 17-year-old demonstrator was defying an anti-parade ordinance in Birmingham, Alabama, and was attacked by a police dog on May 3rd. On May 4th, the picture is on the paper. Cover, New York Times. On May 4th, 1963, during a meeting at the White House with members of a political group, Kennedy discussed the photo, that photo which appeared on the front page of the New York Times. And these are some other pictures, a woman getting doused and soaked with a fire hose. While this is going on, Kennedy has a Vietnam problem. In April 1963, Kennedy tells a friend, we don't have a prayer staying in Vietnam. Those people hate us. They're going to throw our asses out of there at any point. But I can't give up that territory to the communists and get the American people to reelect me. So he's got a Vietnam problem. I can't leave because of politics. And he's got a civil rights issue problem. I can't do anything because of politics. He's frozen. He's got to stay where he stayed in 1960 if he wants to get reelected. But Kennedy is shaken about what happened in Birmingham, Alabama, and begins to change his mind on a number of things concerning the civil rights movement. The world is watching. This is going global. These pictures are all over the world. Again, you got film, and the film gets out of the United States, and it's going around the world. Uh, a picture like this, Birmingham, Alabama. 1963, keep Birmingham schools white. The New York Times also changed. Uh, Abe Rosenthal, the uh, executive editor of the New York Times, a guy that Robert Lipsight, you might remember Robert Lipsight, he was on PBS on Channel 13. He also wrote for the New York Times. He's an acquaintance of mine who actually uh, told me I should get out and give some talks because he does uh, on, uh, on the island out East Hampton. He doesn't do it very frequently. He is about 84, 85 years old now. Uh, the New York Times published more stories about civil rights those two weeks than it had in the previous year. Two years, 
televised scenes of children campaigning against rigid segregation, being bitten by dogs, knocked off their feet by water, fired with enough power to rip bark off a tree, caused international outrage. The world was watching, and JFK knew it. And he knew scenes like this with George Wallace uh, standing at a door and then leaving after making his talk and uh, Negroes walking into school were not helping him around the world. George Wallace, the governor of Alabama, came to national prominence when he kept the campaign pledge to stand in the school door to block integration of Alabama's public schools. Wallace read the proclamation when he stood in the doorway to block the attempt of two black students, Vivian Malone and James Hood, to register at the University of Alabama. Kennedy federalized the Alabama National Guard, ordered its units to the university campus. Wallace stepped aside, returned to the capital of Montgomery, and the students entered. There is uh, Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Council. They begin to make plans for a march on Washington. Not the first time that uh, Negro or colored people decided that they were going to march on Washington. A guy by the name of A. Philip Randolph wanted to do it two decades earlier. On June 11th, John Kennedy is giving an address to the country and the Southern Christian Leadership Council announced its plans to demonstrate in Washington for a new civil rights legislation or new civil rights legislation or the first really since 1875. The group calls for a massive militant monumental sit-in on Congress and massive acts of civil disobedience all over the nation. While Kennedy does make the speech, the administration seemed to be dithering on just what to do. A few hours after the speech, another civil rights leader, Medgar Evers, is killed in Mississippi. JFK finally joins the civil rights movement on June 11. Here is his speech. It ought to be possible for American students of any color to attend any public institution they select without having to be backed up by troops. It ought to be possible for American consumers of any color to receive equal service in places of public accommodation, such as hotels and restaurants and theaters and retail stores, without being forced to resort to demonstrations in the street. And it ought to be possible for citizens of any color to register and to vote in a free election without interference or fear of reprisal. It ought to be possible for every American to enjoy the privileges of being American without regard to his race or his color. Notice the word his, his, and his, because I'm gonna mention something about that in a minute. In short, every American ought to have the right to be treated as he would wish to be treated, or one would wish his children to be treated. But this is not the case. 100 years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons, are not fully free. You notice uh, the word her isn't there, or granddaughters. Uh, women were not included in the civil rights movement. It was only for men. And uh, in 1964, when there would be a civil rights uh, act passed, women did not necessarily get everything they should have gotten. Medgar Evers was assassinated shortly after the Kennedy speech. On May 28th, a Molotov cocktail was thrown into the garage of Evers' home in Mississippi, and five days before his death, he was nearly run down by a car after he emerged from the Jackson, Mississippi NAACP office. In Jackson, Mississippi, on June 12th, Evers pulled into his driveway after returning from an integration meeting, that was the night, early morning, where he had conferred with NAACP lawyers, emerging from his car and carrying NAACP t-shirts that stated Jim Crow must go. Evers was struck in the back with a bullet that ricocheted into his home. He staggered 30 feet before collapsing, dying at a local hospital 50 minutes later. Uh, the police, and, and I knew a guy who was a, a UPI. He was down in uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Arkansas, that area uh, in the 50s and 60s. And he was pulled out by UPI. 
because he, UPI was worried that uh, the segregationists were going to go after him, who was Jewish, uh, and they pulled him out and put somebody else in there by 1962. And he was telling these stories about covering things that went on and how the police really didn't really didn't want to solve any crimes. And here's a point in case. In 1964, 31 years and three trials later, Evers' killer, Byron Dilla Beckwith, was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Um, Beckwith, Dilla Beckwith, basically, yeah, we know he did it, but we're not going to really pursue it all that much. And that was not uncommon in the South. JFK would meet with the Evers family a few days later at, in the Oval Office at the White House. Evers and his wife, Murley, established the NAACP office in Jackson, Mississippi in the mid-1950s. He led marches, prayer vigils, voter registration drives, and boycotts. As early as 1955, eight years earlier, Evers' name appeared on a death list. He continued uh, to appeal to blacks and whites to work together for a peaceful solution to social problems. Evers orchestrated a boycott of white merchants in Jacksonville in the early 1960s. Um, you got Kennedy giving the talk, you got Evers murdered, and on June 14th, three days between Kennedy's talk, the murder, and this, RFK addressing protesters, some protesters, uh, and uh, talking about uh, what they may be able to do or may not be able to do. And if you look in this picture, there are the cameras with the film taking the uh, video of RFK talking, trying to get the people to calm down a little bit. Meanwhile, JFK flies out to Germany and he takes a look at the Berlin Wall, which went up in 1961 during the first year of his presidency. Uh, the Cold War in Berlin. And he talks about the communists and the West. There are many people in the world who really don't understand or say they don't. What is the great issue between the free world in the communist world, let them come to Berlin. There are some who say that communism is the wave of the future. Let them come to Berlin. And there are some who say in Europe and elsewhere, we can work with the communists. Let them come to Berlin. And there are even a few who say that it is true that communism is an evil system, but it permits us to make economic progress. Lesson not Berlin coming. Let them come to Berlin. Now, I mentioned this guy to John F. Kennedy's right. His name, A. Philip Randolph. He's meeting with JFK. Martin Luther King is there, too. And uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of A. Philip Randolph, but he has his interesting story. Uh, the March on Washington. Well, A. Philip Randolph was planning a yet another march in Washington for jobs. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, the SCLC, they're planning one for freedom. The two groups decided to merge their efforts into one mass protest. Uh, Randolph and his chief aide, Bayon Rustin, their march would call for fair treatment and equal opportunity for Black Americans, as well as advocate for the passage of a Civil Rights Act. Now, let's go back to 1941. A. Philip Randolph, 1941, and he is planning a march on Washington. 15,000 Negroes assembled in St. Louis, 20,000 assembled in Chicago, 23,500 Negroes assembled in New York City. We, what do they want? Well, they want free from want, free from fear, free from Jim Crow. And he planned this protest in 1941, but he wanted to get government jobs in 1941 from Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, a. Philip Randolph did lead five marches on Washington throughout the years. Before the 1963 march, uh, he led three smaller marches in the 1950s for school integration. His first 1941, well, did not quite get off the way he thought it would. Uh, he pointed out blacks were excluded from jobs in the defense industry, and he began traveling the country, rallying potential marchers with the message, we loyal Negro American citizens demand the right to work and fight for our country. Remember, the military was not desegregated until Harry Truman's time. 
Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, invited Randolph to the White House on June 25th, 1941, which was six days before the June, July 2nd March uh, was scheduled to take place. Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802, banning discrimination in the government and defense industry. Randolph won one. And well, you take a look at the big six, they're not exactly the tallest guys in the world, but the big six would meet in New York at the Roosevelt Hotel, which is soon to be demolished to re be replaced by a huge tower. And uh, the guy way on the left was John Lewis, around in 1963, passed away this year, Georgia congressman. Uh, and he's part of the big six, which included Randolph and Martin Luther King. On July 2nd, six civil rights leaders, 1963, gather at the Roosevelt Hotel in New York, in Manhattan. Randolph, John Lewis, Whitney Young, James Farmer, and Roy Wilkins. They would be known as the Big Six, and it was Randolph, who had been doing this for a while, at least 22 years, who was able to get all six on the same page. The demands for JFK and Congress, comprehensive and effective civil rights legislation from the present Congress without compromise or filibuster to guarantee all Americans access to all public accommodations, decent housing, adequate and integrated education, the right to vote, withholding of federal funds from all programs in which discrimination exists. Desegregate the schools. Don't treat our children like prisoners. We protest school segregation. This is going on around the country. This is St. Louis uh, that we're looking at. More demands, desegregation of all school districts in 1963, enforcement of the 14th Amendment, reducing congressional representation of states where citizens are disenfranchised, a new executive order banning discrimination in all housing supported by federal funds, the authority for the Attorney General to institute injunctive suits when any constitutional right is violated. And even more, a massive federal program to train and place all unemployed workers, Negro and white, on, meanif on meaningful and, dig and dignified jobs at decent wages, a national minimum wage act that will give all Americans a decent standard of living. That is still an issue in 2020 a broad and fair labor standards act to include all areas of employment which are presently excluded a federal fair employment practices act barring discrimination by federal state and municipal governments and by employers contractors employment agencies and trade unions 1963 would go down in history in the United States anyway as the summer of protests. Segregated schools must stop now. Police brutality must stop now. Uh, but this guy in Maryland, uh, if you notice the guy in the front of the picture with the whitest shirt, he's got eggshells on the back of his head. This is taking place in Maryland. This guy who owns uh, the sandwich shop uh, cracks a raw egg over a protester's head. That was Robert uh, Fen uh, Fessenfelt, who is the owner of a segregated lunchroom in Cambridge, Maryland, and he doused a white integrationist with water. On July 8th, 1963, the integrationist Edward Dickerson was among three whites and eight African-American protesters who knelt on the sidewalk in front of the restaurant to sing freedom songs. A raw egg uh, was broken over his head, and it's visible, obviously, in that picture. The protesters were later arrested, and uh, I guess uh, Fessenfeld wasted an egg. The summer of discontent, according to the Justice Department, DOJ in the United States in the 10 weeks before the March on Washington, there were 758 demonstrations in 186 cities with 14,773 arrested. And there is a cross burning in Chicago. That's an old, it looks like a rambler, doesn't it? Maybe an old rambler. Anyway, uh, a cross burning in Chicago.
Uh, I was up at the Berkshires uh, during the summer, and I stopped uh, at the childhood, or well, the area where W.E.D. Du Bois, uh, who came up with the term unforgivable black, talking about uh, Jack Johnson, the heavyweight champion in the 19-teens in boxing, how his only crime really was he was unforgivably black. Uh, anyway, uh, I went to uh, Du Bois' uh, home just to walk through, take a couple pictures. The problem of the 20th century uh, is the problem of color line. And uh, he started uh, his protest back in the 1900s. Uh, in 1905, Du Bois was the uh, Du Bois. Uh, was the founder and general secretary of the Niagara Movement, an African-American protest group of scholars and professionals. Du Bois founded and edited The Moon in 1906 and The Horizon, 1907 to 1910, as organs for the Niagara Movement. He also ran for Senate in 1950, New York, the American Labor Party back in 1950. In 1909, the boys was among the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP, and from 1910 to 34, served as its director of publicity and research, a member of the board of directors and founder and editor of The Crisis, the monthly magazine. Uh, he ran for the Senate in 1950, but in the 1950s, he would run into McCarthyism uh, and communism and socialism and, um, and the right channels and all that. Uh, in the 1950s, his socialist views got him in trouble during the McCarthy years. He would die in Guyana, uh, but never renounced his American citizenship. The March on Washington is going to take place in the boys dies the night before the March on Washington on August 27th, August 28th, Quarter of a million people gather at the Lincoln Memorial. Randolph leads off the day's diverse array of speakers, closing his speech with the promise we are here to we here today are only the first wave. When we leave, it will be to carry the civil rights revolution home with us in every nook and cranny of the land, and we shall return again and again to Washington in ever-growing numbers until total freedom is ours. And um, if you were at the Lincoln uh, Memorial and looking down at the crowd, that is what you saw. Other speakers included uh, Randolph's assistant, Bayard Rustin, NAACP President Roy Wilkins, John Lewis of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, civil rights veteran, Daisy Lee Bates, and uh, from New Rochelle, Ozzie Davis and Ruby D, the actors. Uh, the march included musical performances from Marian Anderson, who of course sang at the Lincoln Memorial around 1939, Joan Baez, who uh, ended her career last year, at least touring last year, Bob Dylan, and Mahaya, Mahala Jackson, and there is Mahala Jackson. Um, Martin Luther King didn't really know what he wanted to write about or talk about, and she told him, Tell him about your dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. King originally thought the speech should be low-key since he was speaking to a broad audience about controversial themes. King looked out over the crowd as he explained later in an interview. All of a sudden, this thing came to me that I've used. I've used many times before that thing about I have a dream. And I just felt that I wanted to use it here. King started speaking completely off the cuff. I have a dream. And there is Jane Tillman Irving to my left, or your left, my right, and uh, Rich Lamb, WCBS Radio Ace Reporter, City Hall. Uh, people I've known for a long time in the radio business. And it was Jane Tillman Irving who helped push me to this talk. Uh, that night she explained to me all about The Green Book. Some of you probably saw the movie, The Green Book. The Green Book uh, was uh, a pamphlet for Negroes. Uh, Negro motorists on where to go and how to go and where not to get in trouble and where you could get gas and where you could get food, where you could stay. Jane Tillman Irving, who attended the uh, March on Washington, said she was going home with her mother and they stopped for gas. And guess what? They didn't get gas because it was whites only. They had to get the Green Book 
to find the next gas station. And there is the Negro Motorist Green Book, uh, which told you how to conduct yourself. Uh, and it was uh, done by a guy out of Harlem, uh, Victor H. Green, New York City. Uh, Jane Tillman Irving told me there was exhilaration, then deflation. The inspiring speech, this is the moment, then the reality. America was still a segregated nation. Gas stations only serve whites. Hotels refused Negroes. Great speech, nothing changed. In September, the 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed in Birmingham, Alabama, as you see in those two pictures. It was September 15th, less than three weeks after the March on Washington, a dynamite bomb planted by four Klansmen, uh, or Klansmen, killed four inside the 16th Street Baptist Church. Uh, Adam May Collins was 14 at the time. She'd be 71 now. Denise McNair, 11 at the time. She'd be 68. Carol Robinson, also 14. She'd be 71. And Cynthia Wesley, she'd also be 71. She was 14. More than 20 others injured in the attack time to, uh, time to occur during a Youth Day tribute to the uh, part of the local youth people in the Birmingham campaign. Again, uh, as I've said before, um, police really didn't go after people committing crimes in the South. After the FBI provides long concealed evidence, concealed evidence, long concealed evidence, Robert Chambliss is convicted of murder in 1977. Thomas Blanton, 2001. Bobby Frank Cherry, well, he was convicted in 2002. A fourth bomber, Herman Cash, died in 1994 without ever being indicted. Change is gonna come. That was one of Sam King's songs, uh, Sam Cooke's songs, a change is gonna come. But the change that was gonna come is not coming yet. On October 8th, Sam Cooke and his band are arrested after trying to register at a whites-only motel in Louisiana. In the months that follow, he would record a song, A Change Is Gonna Come. Meanwhile, we haven't forgotten about South Vietnam, have we? Because if we have, that's my problem. Uh, South Vietnam, Dion, the guy that everybody wanted in Washington to uh, be their guy in South Vietnam became a handful. And the South Vietnamese army decided they had to do something with him. Now, uh, this is a Buddhist monk who decided that uh, he couldn't take what was going on in South Vietnam and he gets some gasoline, lights a match, and uh, Fitch Quang Duke kills himself. And that picture, I, 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 I kind of you know, look at that picture, say, should I or shouldn't I? But I think the picture is appropriate. First of all, it went worldwide. And secondly, it showed how much the Buddhists hated DM and what a problem that was. The suppression of Buddhists in South Vietnam became known as the Buddhist crisis. DM did little to ease the tensions, though he promised reforms. Many people suspected that his brother and closest advisor now who was actually the decision maker in the Saigon government and the person behind the Buddhist suppression. The Buddhist, uh, the Buddhist demonstrations continued through the spring and summer. In June, the Buddhist monk uh, publicly lit himself on fire. The photograph made the news of the world. Now who's giving JFK advice? Well, William Westmoreland is General William Westmoreland and Robert McNamara is the Secretary of Defense. I'm not sure that McNamara was really qualified to be the Secretary of Defense. After all, he had been a bean counter at uh, the Ford Motor Company when uh, he came into John F. Kennedy's life. Uh, maybe economics, I'm not sure what he knew about defense. He did serve, of course, in World War II, uh, but he was made Secretary of Defense. Kennedy is trying to talk to DM, and he says to him, hey, we need major reforms. But Diem said, eh, no way. In August, Diem declared martial war and his forces raided pagodas of the Buddhist group behind the protests. Soon after, the South Vietnamese military officials decided we need to call Washington to find out what we are going to do and if they would be too bothered if there was a military coup in Saigon. 
That is Ike and Diem in happier times in the 1950s. Under Eisenhower and Kennedy, the U.S. gave millions of dollars to prop up the French in Vietnam and then Diem and sending military advisors to support Diem's corrupt anti-communist government. On September 2nd, JFK gives an interview to old Iron Pants, uh, Walter Cronkite. During that interview, he says, Diem, the regime has gotten out of touch with the people. On November 1st, 1963, South Vietnamese generals used a strong military force to seize control of several strategically important outposts in Saigon and other areas of South Vietnam. Initially, Diem and his brother refused to surrender. When it became clear that they could not stop the coup from succeeding, the brothers used a secret exit to escape the presidential palace after dark. Um, they were able to get away for a short time, but were captured at a Catholic church a few hours later. A uh, short time later, Duang Van Min, also known as Big Min, ordered the execution of both men and assumed the leadership of the country. Kennedy was stunned, totally caught unprepared by this, and was upset when he learned of the murder. Meanwhile, back in Iraq, there's another problem. Saddam Hussein is out the door again. Uh, the second, 1963, Iraqi coup d'etat started on November 13th, ended on November 18th, uh, following the Ba'ath Party's divisions. Uh, the pro Nasserist, uh, Nasser being the uh, president of Egypt, uh, Iraqi officials led a military coup within the Ba'ath Party. The coup itself was bloodless, but 250 people would be killed in related actions. The Nasserist, named after the Egyptian president, Gamal Abdul Nasser, favored Arab unity. In fact, at one point, there was something called the UAR, the United Arab Republic, which uh, was a um, combination, not a combination, of marriage between Syria and Egypt. Now we get to February 22nd, 1963. And uh, in my background, I covered sports. And in my background, I covered a lot of labor and a lot of um, strikes and lockouts in sports and court cases. I wasn't one who went to many games, so it seemed. I was always the one who had to go to the courtrooms or I had to go and, and do the stakeouts with labor or the negotiations and all. And so I got to know Larry O'Brien, who is the commissioner of the National Basketball Association between, say, 1975 and 1984. And uh, I once asked uh, Larry O'Brien, who was part of the inner circle for Kennedy with uh, the Boston Mafia, which included Kenny O'Donnell and Bowers, and even though he was an Irish, uh, Sorensen, who wrote the, who actually wrote the book Profiles in Courage, and Pierre Salinger, that was the inner circle, so to speak. And I once asked Larry, uh, I once was asking Larry O'Brien about uh, Lyndon Johnson, whether he succumbed to Walter Cronkite, um, and didn't run again. And he said, no. Lyndon Johnson wouldn't listen to somebody on TV when he decided not to run uh, in 1968 for re-election. Uh, I bring the story up because my friend, the late Marv Schneider from the Associated Press, once did an interview with O'Brien, and um, O'Brien talked about the last day of John Kennedy, and uh, they were in Fort Worth at a hotel. Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, John Kennedy went up to the roof to walk around with uh, Larry O'Brien. And on that morning, as Marv told me, Larry O'Brien and John Kennedy are walking and they're on the roof and Kennedy just looks around and he says, you know, Larry is a great big world out there. If they're gonna get me, they're gonna get me. Uh, O'Brien really, he never told me that story. He told it to Marv, I'm sure he told it to other people. Uh, but Kennedy had some sort of fatalistic, I'm not sure if it's a fatalistic clue as to what was going on that day, but he certainly had it on his mind that day. So Kennedy is campaigning in Texas. Um, Vietnam is still an issue, even though Kennedy knew that uh, maybe he should get out of Vietnam, but he wouldn't do it for political reasons. Civil rights movement is an issue, but he wouldn't help out for political reasons. He's in Texas for a reason because he's looking for votes with the election 11 and a half months away. 
So he's at the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce giving a talk the morning of November 22nd. And there is Larry O'Brien who went up to the uh, roof uh, with Kennedy just to hang out a little bit. And um, yeah, that's what he was doing. It's raining, um, it's raining. Uh, Kennedy goes out there without an umbrella and um, he's talking to the crowd. Um, the crowd, several thousand people. They're in the parking lot outside the hotel, the Texas hotel. Uh, a platform is set up and the president wearing no protection against the weather comes out to give some brief remarks. There are no faint hearts in Fort Worth, he began, and I appreciate your being here this morning. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy is organizing herself. It takes longer, but of course she looks better than we do when she does it. He went on to talk about the nation's need for being second to none in defense and in space, although he really didn't care about space. The only thing he cared about was landing on the moon before the Soviets. Uh, didn't care about the other stuff, just get me to the moon and back. Uh, for continued growth in the economy and the willingness of citizens of the United States to assume the burdens of leadership. And this is the final breakfast, and she organized herself, Jackie Kennedy, in, in the pink outfit, which doesn't look pink in the black and white picture, but obviously it's, it's, it's an outfit that uh, is forever, forever etched in history. Uh, the last speech, uh, inside the hotel, focusing on military preparedness, we are still the keystone in the arch of freedom. We will continue to do our duty, and the people of Texas, will be in the lead. Kennedy and his crew would fly from Fort Worth to Dallas, which is about a 45 minute car ride, uh, but he decided to fly. They land uh, in Texas, they get into the uh, motorcade, and um, they go through the streets of Dallas, and Kennedy does not have a top on the car. 12.30 p.m. That is 12.30 p.m. Central Time. Crowds of excited people line the streets and wave to the Kennedys. The car turned off Main Street at Daly Plaza at 12.30. As it was passing the Texas School Depository, gunshots uh, suddenly reverberated in the plaza. I've been uh, in that building, and I've been to the sixth floor, and there are markings on the street where Kennedy was when he was hit. Um, I thought it was a big distance. It was a distance of no more than 200 feet uh, from where Oswald was to the car. It was, it was really close. Bullets struck the president's neck and head as he slumped over toward Mrs. Kennedy. The governor, John Connolly, who was in the front seat, was shot in the back. This is where Walter Cronkite becomes the most trusted man on TV and maybe the most trusted man in America. Cronkite reads the bulletin, the president is dead, takes the glasses off, sheds a tear, composes himself, puts the glasses back on, old iron pants is back in the saddle, back to work. And with that, he becomes the most trusted man in America. Lee Harvey Oswald is charged with the murder, also the murder of J.D. Tippett, an officer who was found in a moving house uh, in Dallas. Uh, police arrested him. He was recently hired as an employee at the Texas School Book Depository. He was held for the assassination of Kennedy and the fatal shooting of a patrolman, J.D. Tippett, on a Dallas street. Uh, Lyndon Johnson is sworn in by Sarah Hughes uh, on Air Force One to become the 36th President of the United States with Jackie Onassis, or Jackie Kennedy, rather, with him. Um, and they head back to Washington. Johnson, uh, Jackie Kennedy, along with the president's body. Uh, two days later, Jack Ruby, Jack Rubenstein, Jack Ruby, who owns str a strip joint in Dallas, somehow has access to the Dallas Police Department. Oswald is being transferred. Ruby appears with a gun and shoots Oswald. And uh, we never heard from Lee Harvey Oswald as to why he did the killing, although it was concluded that he did the killing without a motive. That was November 24th on a Sunday morning. That was an execution that was seen live on TV. I saw it live on TV. I was watching it, seven years old at the time. 
Oswald was scheduled to be transferred from police headquarters to the county jail. Viewers across America watched, and the world watched the live television coverage, and they saw this man aim a pistol and fire at point blank range. The assailant, Jack Ruby, Jack Rubenstein from Chicago, a local, this is being nice, nightclub owner. He owns strip joints. Oswald died two hours later, virtually in the same place that uh, Kennedy died two days earlier. The funeral. The funeral is November 25th, 1963, and it's at Arlington Cemetery, and he's laid to rest, he being President Kennedy, laid to rest. The funeral attended by heads of state and representatives from more than 100 countries. Millions watched on TV at the gravesite, Jacqueline Kennedy and the husband, her husband's brothers, Robert and Edward, lit the eternal flame. This is a side note. Again, the Henry Ford Museum. That car that you're seeing there was the car that Kennedy was killed in. It was also used by Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon before being replaced. Uh, the car was a 1961 Lincoln, and this is the uh, plaque in front of the car. Tra uh, tragic event occurs. The modern new four-door convertible seemed well-suited to a young, forward-thinking president. But tragedy struck when President Kennedy was assassinated in November 1963 while riding this car through the streets of Dallas. As the world mourned, the Secret Service quickly took steps to have this vehicle rebuilt so it would better protect future presidents. Later modifications during the Johnson and Nixon's presidencies only served to illustrate the continual tension between the president's desire to be seen and the Secret Service efforts to protect them. That car was retired about seven years after John F. Kennedy was killed in it. Beatlemania rocked England. Throughout the year, the Beatles are gaining steam and girls are screaming and they're selling all sorts of records in 1963. George, Paul, Ringo, and John Oddly enough, the Beatles' first television exposure would be on November 22nd, 1963, in America on CBS Morning News with Mike Wallace. Wallace and his producers did a profile on the Beatles in a segment that was scheduled to be repeated on the nightly news hosted by Walter Cronkite, which would have been a much bigger audience than the Mike Wallace show. It was shelved. Cronkite would show the piece on CBS News on December 10th. The Mercury 7 astronauts, the Mercury program is done, finished. Uh, they are um, going to move on to the Gemini program. Space race, Cold War is heating up. The USSR, US wanting to land a man on the moon. The Mercury missions, there were six of them, two suborbital, four orbital, ended after NASA proved it could get astronauts in orbit around the Earth. Soviet Union put a woman in space. But Congress was not sure if putting man on the moon was worth the cost given the problems America had on Earth. And Kennedy wasn't sure that it was worth fulfilling his promise of putting man on the moon by the end of the decade. Uh, if the program was cut, so be it. It wasn't going to be a critical issue for Kennedy in the 1964 presidential race. Again, another political calculus move. Uh, that was the prime minister of uh, Indonesia in 2000, Najib Razak. The only reason I have that up there, me and him together at a party at the St. Regis Hotel, April 15th, 2010 is because Malaysia becomes a country on September 16th, 1963, formed by the merging of the Federation of Malaya and the British Crown Colony of Singapore's Northern Borneo. Uh, the world's a dangerous place, September 25th, and the Dominican Republic, Juan Bosch is deposed by a coup d'etat led by the military with civilian support. October 14th, a revolution starts in Ratfan, South Yemen against British colonial rule. Getting back to W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, the Organization of African Unity it's forms. 30 of the 32 independent countries of Africa meet in uh, Addis Ababa, uh, 
Ethiopia to form the group. It was an outgrowth of the Pan-African movement began by W.E.B. Du Bois and other African American intellectuals. The AOU was intended to foster unity among African nations. The organization stood for the eradication of colonialism, mutual defenses, and the promotion of the economic and social welfare of member states. Kenya becomes independent on December 12th. Great Britain says, see ya, but they remain within the British Commonwealth. Uh, in medicine, Michael DeBacke, uh, down in Houston, artificial heart pump. That was on July 19th, 1963. He installed the artificial pump to assist the patient's damaged heart. And we're talking about vaccines here, and this is really where we're gonna leave it here with the vaccine, uh, because hopefully there'll be the vaccines for COVID and we could get rid of COVID or at least tamper it down within a year. Vaccine against measles, approval was given for the vaccine against measles in 1963. John Anders developed that vaccine. Uh, the strong man in Yugoslavia, Tito, seen there with Kennedy, uh, the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Uh, that was the name that became of Yugoslavia in April of that year. Joseph Bronze Tito was named president for life. He would die in 1980, so he was president for life. The changes to the European nation's name and Tito's authority, part of several socialist reforms, added to the constitution of Yugoslavia that year. And finally, this guy's in a hospital bed and he wants to watch TV, and he does. The portable TV is introduced in Japan, the portable TV. He's sitting there, he's watching it. It was a hit in Japan. For some reason in the United States, it wasn't. Camelot was fiction. It was a Broadway play. Fiction, that's all it was, fiction. Life in Camelot. The Kennedy years. Well, maybe not so. November 29th, four days after her husband's burial, the widowed mother of two invited Life magazine journalist Theodore H. White, who wrote The Making of the President in 1960, to the Kennedy family compound in Hyannisport, Massachusetts. She wanted White to help rescue her husband's legacy by linking his presidency to King Arthur in the Round Table. Camelot, and I don't know if any of you saw Camelot back in the day, Camelot was running on Broadway. She said the lines he loved to hear were, don't let it be forgot, that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. Oh, by the way, JFK hated musicals. It was all made up by Jacqueline Kennedy to preserve her husband's legacy. Long-term impact in 1963, that's me in Atlanta outside the Ebenezer Baptist Church across the street from the Martin Luther King Center. Lyndon Johnson would sign a civil rights law into effect in 1964. The Beatles would conquer the United States in 1964. Martin Luther King would be killed in 1968. Saddam Hussein would get power in Iraq in 1968. Hafez al-Assad would seize power in Syria in 1969. The United States would escalate its Vietnam involvement in 1964. In 1964, the Warren Commission ruled. Oswald acted alone in killing Kennedy. Nikita Khrushchev would be ousted as the Soviet premier in 1964, and man would land on the moon. John Lewis passed away earlier this year. That was John Lewis by the Pettus Bridge being clubbed by a cop um, as uh, he would other dem as he and other demonstrators tried to cross that bridge during a uh, uh, protest in 1965. In 2020, uh, John Lewis's body went across the Pettus Bridge back to Georgia, uh, and the same state troopers who beat him up back in 1965, their heirs stood at attention as his hearse and casket went over the bridge. Tito would die in 1980. Yugoslavia would break apart. Saddam Hussein would terrorize his people. He's toppled in 2003, hanged in 2006. John Lewis, the last of the big six, would pass away in 2020, and the Al-Assad family still runs Syria. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, any questions, any comments?
Uh, thank you for inviting me. I hope uh, this brought back some stuff. Wow. Wow. Who, who said wow? I said wow. Yeah. I said wow. Having lived through it all, it was fabulous to see it all together in one place. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, it's funny because when people talk about 1963, it's Camelot, the Kennedy assassination. There's a lot more that went on. And a lot of that impacted our lives and still to this day impacts our lives. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a repetition. What's, what's today happened back then? I mean, it's all... It's well, you know... You know, um, you know, what's old is new again. And, old is uh, new, it's all over you know, again. History always repeats itself. We're doing the same crap. Yeah, history always repeats itself. Anybody, besides, you. anybody besides Gal? Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I wasn't in the United States at the time of these events. So I learned of them later on. Uh, I was living in Israel and... Um, very, you know, we had a sketchy understanding of the civil rights movement at the time. You know, I was certainly aware of the death of, uh, it was a Friday, I remember. I was coming home from a uh, organized event, you know, in Israel. And I was in a taxi hearing about it. And it was shocking, but all of the other relevant historical events I became aware of only once I was an adult and lived in the United States. So it's interesting. Thank you. I can tell you where I was. I was at Dominic's little grocery store on Stanton Street in the Lower East Side when I saw somebody crying um, who said the president had, had was dead. And uh, that night, my, my grandfather and my uncle owned a, uh, they made pants. That's what they did. They made pants. It was right near Orchard Street. But they were making a delivery to the Bronx, and I was with them that night, and they were listening to the radio, and uh, I remember that ride to the Bronx that night because they had to deliver a shipment to a store for Saturday, uh, but the store owner didn't know if he was going to, in the Bronx, be open on Saturday, but uh, I remember that, that weekend vividly. I was seven years old. Yeah. In, in New York, on, on the day he was killed, Cars were stopped. People were running over to cars to have them turn on their radios to see what was going on. It was just very, very amazing. But another thing from your talk I found very interesting was I lived in the Bronx in the early 60s, and there was no segregation. And when you hear about segregation going on in other parts of this country at the same time, it is just amazing. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, well, it's amazing how much one year. <laughs> yeah, except, you know, I, I do a whole series from, from the 1960s. And um, you could build upon it. And, uh, but, you know, out of, out of 63, you had Vietnam, you had Saddam Hussein, right? You had uh, El Assad, and you had so many things that happened that year. Um, and, and people don't, you know, how long was Saddam Hussein a thorn to the United States? Um, the Assad family as well in Syria. Uh, and that all came out of 1963. And nobody talks about that aspect of 1963. But there was a lot that happened that year. Yeah. It, it's interesting how uh, the myth of Kennedy persists, despite the fact that his presidency was rather short-lived. It was short-lived, uh, and he had a lot of failures. Um, and um, if you look at the Bay of Pigs was a failure, a big failure in 1961. Um, and, you know, there, was, there were a lot of things that, you know, he wanted to do his way. Uh, he never took Eisenhower's advice. Uh, he never even sought Eisenhower's advice. These were all young guys. And he didn't like Lyndon Johnson, who knew how to run Washington. Um, but um, if you look, you know, Kennedy's legacy, I guess, Jacqueline Kennedy tried to save it with Camelot. Uh, it's, it's a mixed legacy at best. And I think that uh, once the baby boomer, uh, and I'm a baby boomer as well, once the generation moves on and people will look back at history, they'll have a, a, a lot different look. 
because remember, Kennedy was the first TV star president as well. Uh, whether you go back to the Kennedy-Nixon debate or all the news conferences that he had where he told jokes, among other things. So he was, um, you know, he, he, um, he seemed to be a very likable person, uh, at least the public persona. And okay, you look at the public persona and you kind of forget some of the things that happened during his time. But uh, he left, a, he, his legacy, let's put it this way, was very, very incomplete. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I, I guess um, it would be fun if you could, I don't know, you or, you know, what was going on culturally, you know, in terms of the theater and music and literature and so on. That would be an interesting at the same time. It's my 1964 talk. I have a lot of that in 1964. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready. 1964 was the year of the Beatles. It was the year of the World's Fair, among other things. And uh, uh, satirical TV in the United States, that was the week that was. Um, which is the father of Rowan and Martin's Laughing and Smothers Brothers and Saturday Night Live. Um, there were, there was culturally 64. The 64, my friend Bob Lipsight, who um, used to be on Channel 13, um, he has a book called The Accidental Sports Writer, where he, he covered the Beatles meeting Cassius Clay, and he called it the, the, the Collision of Worlds, which was in February of 1964. But culturally, the, culturally, the 60s started in 1964. Uh, it was still the Broadway, you know, and, and it killed off Broadway and, and things of that nature, uh, at least music-wise. Um, I guess the sound of music did come out, what, 64, 65, but... Uh, Things had shifted by that point. And I also talked about Sidney Poitier, who won a big award in 1964. So I do talk more culturally. Yeah, well, I look forward to it. And we some, I, I did, I actually, yeah. I actually did that talk last yeah. night for Suffering, uh, the Suffering Library in 1964. And this guy at the end said, I'm really surprised at you. I said, what are you surprised by? He said, you forgot something. I said, what'd you forget? He said, well, and he gives me this story about, you know, he's working at Grossinger's and, and he's talking about Jenny Grossinger and all this other stuff. And he finally gets to the point. He says, my father got me a brand new car. And I said, I bet you he got you a 1965 Mustang. He said, how'd you know? <laughs> I said, because somehow, it, I, as you were talking, it leads me up to the fact that I forgot to say that the first Mustangs came off of the assembly plant in 64, the 65 Mustang. And he said, yeah, you forgot about that. So when I do the 1964 talk from now on, I could ask anybody, do you have a 65 Mustang? So <laughs> that, was, that was how the talk ended last night. I'm disappointed. He said, you hit all the areas except one. <laughs> he got a new car. OK. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank Michelle for inviting me. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Everybody much. have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you.